altar of Zion, behold thy king come upon to thee, humble and meek. Honor to the Lord, son of David! Master, you are the hope of Israel. You are our prophet and our savior! I can't help but engage this uh, Palm Sunday story and the stories of the Passion at a couple of different levels. One is, as a student of the Bible, you know, I have questions about how it all came about. What did it really look like? Um, what actually happened and what does it mean? But as a pastor, I can't help ask, who, who are these people? Who? Who are the personalities involved, the people? What are their lives like? Are they curiosity seekers? Have they just gathered because, you know, they heard a noise in the streets and wondered what it was all about? We see it all the time, every time a siren goes off or a fire truck runs by. Or are they people who knew who Jesus was and that had heard him speak? Are they people maybe who've witnessed some of his miracles in the past. But there's another group of observers here, uh, this story, that until uh, this Easter season I hadn't really thought a lot about until I read this story as Matthew presents it and noticed for the first time how prominent this one group is in the unfolding events. And that's the Roman soldiers. And the Roman soldiers had a vested interest in this story as it unfolds because as the people gathered there in the streets, they were waving a national symbol of liberty in the palm branch. And they were shouting the word Hosanna, which we use in church. We use the word Hosanna almost synonymously with the word Hallelujah. Hallelujah means praise the Lord, but Hosanna means something very different. Hosanna means Lord Deliver us, Lord, save us. Now this save me, this Hosanna, shouted by the people of Jerusalem as Jesus entered into the city is a much deeper sort of save me. It, it's a deeper save me or a different save me than the one that most of us mean when we use the word in church too because for us salvation is this spiritual deliverance that comes to us through the blood of Jesus Christ. But for them, those people that were shouting Hosanna on the streets of Jerusalem, save me was, was a very different much more concrete cry. This was a battle cry. The cry for military deliverance. And, and the soldiers there, the Roman soldiers there, couldn't help but hear it that way. They were wondering if this was the beginning of a battle, this was the beginning of a war between Rome and the Jews of Palestine. Now, usually we think of Roman soldiers because it's the way we've seen them in the movies as uh, uh, being foreigners in Jerusalem who've been come in from the outside as this conquering army. And they're portrayed in the movies with the red and gold of the Roman legions. But in fact, the Roman legions didn't enter Palestine until well after the time of Jesus during the uh, first Jewish re revolt. Uh, the Roman soldiers here in the Gospels were not foreigners at all. They were homegrown. They'd been recruited from among the Jews of Palestine. They had been recruited in cities like Caesarea Maritima or Sebaste, where um, uh, Roman uh, military outposts had been set up. And so these were young men, mostly, who had been raised in Jewish households. And they joined the army uh, because it was a steady paycheck. It wasn't a good paycheck, but it was a paycheck. And it included their food and their shelter. And it wasn't good food and shelter, but it, it was better 
than many of the people around them. They had joined the Roman army because, you know, the bad news is it was just a step up from slavery. But the good news is it was a step up from slavery and it was a big step up from starving to death in the countryside. And because they had seen the, the work that the Roman soldiers had been doing up to that point, which was acting more in, in, as judges and juries and court systems uh, going from town to town to settle minor disputes among the citizens, or it was the work of a corps of engineers that moved through the countryside improving especially the road systems of Jerusalem, but also other uh, public buildings. They were builders. They were peacekeepers. They didn't really view the soldiers as an invading force, and so they had joined in as a way of doing their part as being citizens in a hard time. And if you had asked them, were they Jews or were they Romans, well, they worked under a Roman standard, and yet most of them would have told you that they were Jews. And now, as this man enters Jerusalem, and the battle cry is lifted up, Lord, deliver us. They have a foot in the world of Rome, under whose standard they serve, but also a foot in the world of Jewish Palestine, where they had been raised. They have a foot in each world in these shouts of Hosanna and the waving of the palm branches as Jesus enters Jerusalem, brings those two worlds crashing together. And so they ask the same question that everyone else asks that day as they watch Jesus entertain. Who is this? The people ask. And the immediate answer is, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. I'm sure when the Roman soldiers heard that answer, they gave something of a sigh of relief because we know what to do with prophets in those days, right? I mean, there was a day when a prophet was a fearsome figure who carried a sword and had his own military agenda, but that was centuries ago among the Jewish people. The most recent prophet uh, that the people of Jerusalem would remember would be uh, probably John the Baptist. And John the Baptist fit in a very safe category he, he was a curiosity. People came out and listened to him preach, and many of us were baptized by him. But when his preaching started to interfere with the current political agenda, he was simply put in jail. Uh, John's uh, execution was more of a, a historical accident than a political execution. A another prophet, we know what to do with prophets. We tuck them out away where people can't be uh, swayed by their messages anymore. Unfortunately, that's not the only answer that was flying through the air that day. The other one had already been spoken and was going to be spoken again and again in the days ahead. Who is this man? He's, he's the son of David. He, he's the king of the Jews. Now these Roman soldiers had all been recruited to serve Rome, but they recruited in the same cities, the same fortresses, the same military installations that their fathers had been recruited in, and many of them, you know, uh, uh, military, uh, tended to be go down from generation to generation, as it often does even still today. So many of them had fathers who were soldiers and grandfathers who were soldiers, and their fathers and grandfathers had reported to those same forts to do the same sort of work for King Herod. My, my daddy served in the army of the King of the Jews. And all of a sudden, these Roman soldiers find themselves in a world that's got too many kings. And there's a war on the horizon, maybe. But there's definitely, if Jesus is the King of Jews, there's already a war in the hearts and minds of those Roman soldiers. Am I a Jew or am I a Roman? Do I serve Caesar or do I serve 
the king of the Jews. If you read carefully in the Gospel of Matthew, you can see evidence that they don't know quite what to do with Jesus. They vacillate back and forth, don't they? You have on the one hand a mock coronation where they place a crown of thorns on his head and rope him like a king and shout, Hail the King of the Jews, and then beat him. But it's virtually in the next breath as they are marching Jesus through the streets of Jerusalem and discover that he's growing weak under the weight of the cross that these same Roman soldiers lift it from his back and find somebody else to carry it, a man by the name of Simon of Cyrene. Well, how do they feel about Jesus? They can't seem to make up their mind. Well, I think what's going on here is, is something we call groupthink, right? I mean, as individuals, they are at war with themselves, and as a group, you know, first one faction takes the lead, and then another faction takes the lead. And we, you know, we can see groupthink at work in our own society today, just in response, say, to the coronavirus. Say, you still can't buy toilet paper uh, at our Walmart here in town. Now, the fact of the matter is, most of us are going to the bathroom and doing the same business we've been doing um, all along, but suddenly we have decided that toilet paper is a hot commodity and worth its weight in gold, and so if you see it, you better buy it. And a, as a group, we've kind of bought into that scarcity mentality, and you can't buy toilet paper or anything closely resembling toilet paper on the shelves at Walmart right now. But it's so easy to be swept along in the tide of it, to not think our own thoughts or make our own decisions, just to do what everyone else is doing. And I think perhaps the beating and mockery of Jesus was one of those moments when even people who had doubts about it didn't express themselves, didn't stop it, didn't say, hey, wait. One of the most tragic examples of this in history, uh, as we look back, uh, is the church's response around the Holocaust in World War II. Uh, even in Germany, there were churches who knew this is not right. And, and, and maybe within their own walls spoke it, but nobody spoke up with a prophetic voice in the world. And so on the one hand, We've got this group of soldiers responding to Jesus with mockery and with beatings. And on the other hand, we've got this group of soldiers saying, you know, no, 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 no. He's weak. He's hurting. Get someone else to carry that cross. And that inner turmoil carries them all the way. That, that, that love-hate relationship with Jesus carries them all the way to the foot of the cross. Then things changed because the skies grew dark. Now, this was an ideal example of something the Romans called an omen. And, and, and it, omens were taken very seriously among uh, the Roman military in particular. If, you came up against a bad omen on the day of battle. You were supposed to withdraw and not fight that day. You did not undertake a military campaign under bad omens. The, the idea of omens has already been introduced to us in the Passion narrative in a part that we didn't read today. Pilate's wife comes to him and says, be careful what you do with this man Jesus today because I had a dream that troubled me about, and, and dreams were a classic presentation of omens. She, she wasn't just uh, trying to share a, a intuition. She was saying, I, I've had a bad omen. This is going to end poorly for you. And so Pilate tries to work his way out of the situation and is unable to do so as the story unfolds. And here we have an omen as these soldiers are crucifying Jesus 
And if you pay attention, the story changes direction in that moment as far as the behavior of the soldiers goes. In a few seconds, Jesus will speak the words, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which we know means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But someone misunderstands it. They say he's trying to call Elijah. And the soldiers immediately stand up and try to get him something to drink. And, and the others say, stand back, stand back. Let's see if Elijah shows up. And there's no sign in Matthew's gospel of mockery in this statement. Somehow this omen has changed their attitude towards Jesus and what's going on in that moment. And some of them are going, we have taken a seriously wrong turn here. And there are more omens to come. It's interesting, isn't it? We have this um, moment in the beginning of Matthew's gospel where he talks about the wise men coming from the east following a star. And that's not how God tells his people he's going to communicate to them with, with, with the star in the heavens. That's a pagan way of understanding God's will. And, and these omens that the Roman soldiers are coming up against here in the Passion narrative, that's not how God told his people he was going to communicate with them. But God is indicating his willingness to speak speak to people in their own language. And so here come the omens. First it turns dark. Then there's an earthquake. And then the veil in the temple is torn from top to bottom. Now as Roman soldiers, these are understood as omens. But in their Jewish upbringing, these men also understood that that veil is what divided God from his people. That was that place through which only the high priest was supposed to step and for that veil to be destroyed they understood somehow as God entering into the world with the rest of us crossing over that invisible barrier to come and be among us. And then during the earthquake, we're told uh, that the tombs were open and many righteous people were resurrected and they appeared in Jerusalem uh, after Jesus' resurrection. Now, that's an odd sort of comment to make, isn't it? For one thing, it's not in any of the other Gospels. And, but if you pay attention to it, what the soldiers experience is an earthquake which later on they interpret to be the moment in which those tombs were opened. It's, a, it's an act of faith that they receive that earthquake as a sign of the resurrection and that the sign of the re resurrection was a sign that all Jews knew accompanying the arrival of the Messiah. And so there, after the dark, after the earthquake, There we have a Roman centurion. And only Matthew tells us that in this belief he is joined by the other soldiers. We have a Roman centurion speaking. Surely this man must be the Son of God. Your military dog tags. They're worn by soldiers, have been worn by soldiers across the centuries. They have the basic, most crucial information about a person engraved in them name, blood type, serial number. They tell us who a person is. It says nowhere on here 
that the wearer of these dog tags is a member of the United States military, and yet, simply by wearing them, we know that that's who they are. It's to whom they belong. Roman soldiers had dog tags too. They were uh, made of lead and hung on uh, leather thongs. They received them at the day of their induction into the Roman military and they wore them throughout their time as a Roman soldier until they retired. You know, as believers, we find ourselves with a foot in two worlds sometimes. A world where Jesus is king and the world where he's not. It, it, you know, if I'm honest, there, there are times when I have too many kings in my life. Until we come to the foot of the cross. And then we're asked a simple question. Who is this man? Is he the son of David, the king of Israel, the Christ? Is he the king of kings, the Lord of lords? Because it turns out the question about who is Jesus is an important component of the question, who am I? as his follower. May we today who gather at the foot of the cross join our voices with those soldiers and their leader that day who declared surely this man is the Son of God.